the revealing and powerful Word of God. Let's examine that in light of entering into His rest. Let's talk about that today in the Word. Good morning and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer. And I just want to tell you, we're grateful for those of you that are following us and listening on our podcast or on our YouTube channel. If you've not subscribed, take a moment and press that little button and the bell so you're notified every time one of these teachings come out. If you don't mind, pass it on through your social media and let's get the word out. Today, we're continuing here in chapter four of Hebrews. I love this concept because it almost seems like a contradiction at first when we look at verse three that says, we who believe do enter the rest. And it's yet here in verse 11 is talking about that we might diligently enter the rest. Which is it? Well, let's get into that and let's talk about it more clearly today. Beginning at verse 11, I'm gonna read down through verse 13. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Interesting and powerful verses. Let's look at this first part, let us therefore. Again, we're tying it into therefore. He just built the case in the previous part of this chapter that we who believe enter into this rest. It says we who believe do enter the rest. Now here he says, be diligent be Therefore, be diligent to enter the rest. The rest is there, but God does not force it upon us, but he offers it to us. Now, bring this back to the Hebrews again. These Christians who had a Hebrew background might have just assumed by who they were that they automatically had the blessings of God. That would remind me of someone who grows up in a church environment or around a Christian family and have never entered in to true saving faith themselves. I've read a lot of statistics and there have been five surveys done of the last 10 years that show that 45% of those who are worshiping together on any given weekend have never been truly converted. George Barna Group says it's around 50%. Now, I don't doubt that to a large degree because we can get so accustomed to living like a believer or around believers that we've never really trusted in Christ for our salvation. Now, in that sense, we're writing to the Hebrews, not saying that they're all born again, but obviously they were Christians that he's writing to, but he's warning them too that we who believe enter in the rest, but to strive to enter or be diligent to enter that rest. It shows here that faith is not just passive or that, again, that word easy believism. Oh, I believe, I believe. But you've never truly, diligently entered into faith. Now, this is interesting about faith because we're saved by grace through faith. But the biblical faith is an active, it's diligent, it's vibrant holding fast to what God says. So this word that's translated as strive here in verse 11 means to concentrate with one's energies as though to achieve a goal. <laughs> so it's very active. It's the opposite of the attitude of the first generation of Israelites because they did not enter into the rest was because of their unbelief. And here, the writer of Hebrews is warning the church, don't fall into that same example. Rather, be diligent to focus on Christ so that anyone who may 
potentially fall into unbelief would not. For example, he says the fullness of God, this entering into this rest. Now, the fact that we who believe do enter the rest shows that there is a rest now in Christ. Now, I don't doubt that the fuller experience of it is beyond this life, as we have been referencing, and obviously that would be the case because the Christians are on a journey. But I want us to hear the constant warning, and I have this in my heart very strongly. As I think through this, I find myself praying for believers or people I know of that have drawn away and have neglected their salvation, and really, where are they? Well, the scripture tells us here how powerful the word of God is, that we are found out, we are exposed by the word. It requires the scriptures, the word of God, to show you your heart. You'll make justifications for everything in your life until the word of God points it out, corrects you, reproves you, and trains you in righteousness. And here he says, for the word of God is living and it's powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit. Now, here's what I see on this. He goes on to talk about the joints of the marrow and the very thoughts and intents of the heart. Number one, I cannot convict myself. Number two, I cannot correct myself. Number three, I cannot train myself. It takes the word of God to point out where I'm wrong, to reprove me, to correct me, The word of God is powerful for that and also to train us in righteousness according to what Paul wrote to Timothy. But here he's speaking here in this particular passage to show us that the word of God is like a two-edged sword. So it divides asunder between the soul and the spirit. Now, both soul and the spirit references the inner man. We would see the spirit as being the true inner man. Though the outward man perishes, the inward man grows day by day. The heart is made up of the soul and the spirit, but the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. There's nothing wrong with the soul. God created us a soul, but the the plan of God is that Christ's spirit in our spirit would be reflected through our soul so that our mind is renewed by the word of God. Our will is submitted to the word of God. Our emotions are healed by the word of God. That's why some believers can be believers but act like unbelievers because their mind has never been renewed. They don't understand the scriptures. They've not learned the scriptures. They've not studied the scriptures. They've not allowed the the word of God to challenge their will. Now, this is, I've had this happen in my life, and even now there are things in the scripture God will point out to me that I have to submit to. The moment you say, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. I've heard Christians tell me, I know that's what the Bible says, but God would not want me to be unhappy. (laughs) Isn't that such a humanistic approach? Because they're judging God's word and not allowing the word of God to judge them. The word of God is sharper. It divides between the soul and the spirit, the very thoughts and intents, meaning my own thoughts, I don't know. The intents of my heart, I don't know. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says, even if my heart says I'm innocent, doesn't mean I'm innocent. Only the Lord judges. So I have to trust the word of God. Any maturing believer, any believer who's going to walk in faith, and I believe that's really what the writer of Hebrews is saying here, that it's the word of God that's going to point out really whether or not you are relying upon God, whether or not you've entered into this rest and trust in him. But this is so powerful for all areas of our life because it can divide between the soul and the spirit. As far as I know, the word of God is the only thing that can divide between the soul and the spirit. The soul and the spirit are so closely interrelated, even though we know that Paul writing to the Thessalonians said that we can grow and mature, you know, be uh, sanctified, both spirit, soul, and body. So even though there's three parts, I don't want us to think we're divided uh, into three parts. It's because we're one, And sure enough, what's in your soul does affect you. And your body is the appetite. You're drawn toward those appetites. It's where you connect with the world. It's the senses, all your senses connected with the body. Your soul is how you express your personality, expresses what you think. It's your opinion and it's your actions and it's your emotions. That's why people who've never been healed by their emotions to allow God's word to heal their emotions 
they can act at 42 like they're 16 years old because their emotions got stunted from bitterness or wound or hurt in their life when they were younger and they never have grown beyond that. They're stunted. That's why we must be no longer conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is by the word of God. Only the word of God can divide between the soul and the spirit, the very thoughts and intents of the heart. And this is what's making clear to us is that nothing is hidden before God. Everything is naked before him. The word of God reveals that, that all things are open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So this whole idea is the word is active. It's powerful. It's living. It's not dead. It is a living work, powerful of the Holy Spirit working through the word. Now we can give many reasons that the word of God is useful for us. Just some of those would be that we're commanded to read the scriptures in 2 Timothy 2.15, that we would do our best, that we would present ourselves as approved of God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. We're told in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that the word of God works in us, that as we accept the word of God, it's actually the word of God which is at work in us. 1 Peter 2.2 2 tells us that it causes us to grow like newborn babes who crave the pure spiritual milk so that we might grow. John 15 and 3 tells us that we're cleansed by the word, that you're already clean because the word, Jesus said, that I've spoken to you. Psalm 119, 105 says the word gives us guidance. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. Psalm one. Two through three says that our life is made prosperous by the fruitfulness of the word because our delight, those who walk after the law of God and on his law, he meditates day and night. And he's like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And whatever he does, he prospers. Why? Because he is receiving the law of God. The word of God gives us victory over sin. Psalm 119 verse nine through 11 how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to the word. How does he do that? Because the word of God hidden in our heart that we might not sin against God. It's our weapon against the enemy, the devil. Ephesians six seventeen says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's an offensive weapon, which is the word of God. So this word is living, it's powerful in our life. It's sharper than any two-edged sword and divides between the soul and the spirit, making there a clear distinction. Now, what I want to do for us here, I want, hope this ministers to you, is that we recognize that though we may not see ourselves bared open, we may not see ourselves as naked, <laughs> but before God we are. And his word is what reveals that to us. And when it says that all things are naked and open, that word open is a word that's not normally used. Uh, Greek words not used at all in the New Testament except here. And it really has a different connotation than what our English word open would be. It would almost be like a wrestler has someone in a headlock <laughs> and holding them. It's a powerful victory hold. So the word of God gets us in a hold uh, because we're open before the Lord. We're open before him and the word overthrows all of those things in our life. So we need to remember in the context here of, of the writer of Hebrews is saying the word of God is what we need in order to enter in to uh, the true rest and not into unbelief. Now we know that Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We know that from the book of Romans, but I want us to know that here in Hebrews, he's saying that the word will reveal and the word also will help you overcome because you're open when you let the word of God speak into your life and you don't resist it. Don't stiff on the word of God. If God's talking to you about something in your life, don't resist it. In fact, that's how you grow in the Lord is allowing the word to speak. It's not what I say or some preacher says or somebody else says, unless it's the word of God. 
That's why sometimes in a message, my heart will be convicted because it's the word of God. It's not necessarily that person. It's not what they're saying themselves. It's the word. That's why Peter says, if anyone speak, let him speak as an oracle of God. That's why preaching, we need to preach the word. People don't need my opinion. They don't need my story per se. They don't need my attitude. Now I can tell my story if in the sense my story reveals the powerful delivering word of God. That's where Paul gave his testimony. But other things can fill that time rather than the word of God. We need to hear the word of God. We need to read the word of God, but mostly we need to receive the word. It is your answer. Let the word put you in a headlock and cause you to be overcomers. Wow. No wonder the book of Hebrews meant so much to those believers. Thank you for walking through today.